So with that note, uh, I know it's a small room. The problem is that uh, any conference room of Mount Sinai, whether it's a hatch or stern, is booked one year in advance. So, so we have no room anywhere, any activities and so. So we like a stern, which we do, we book one year in advance and so. So we could not go to a small room. That's why we didn't invite too many people. But uh, thank you for all the enthusiasm here for a special uh, conference, which we organized in the eve or following uh, morning of our 100th live case, which was successfully done about a few minutes ago uh, with the moderating by Dr. Uh, uh, Mehta, who has done all uh, 100 cases moderation, and uh, Dr. Keeney, who has done 100 cases live, and of course, me giving a lecture and uh, uh, taking through for these complex uh, cases. So this morning, we actually have about two hours of events uh, in terms of uh, two important lectures by the key faculty, which we have invited, a special invitation for this 100th live webcast by Dr. David Moliterno. Uh, he is uh, going to speak on the topic of uh, International Cardiology in the Next Decade. As you know, he's a professor and chairman of Department of Internal Medicine at the University of Kentucky. And then will be Dr. Sunil Rao, who will talk on the improving the safety of PCI, a 17-year journey. Uh, particularly, we know the PCI works, but how can you improve the safety? So one will be giving you future. One, how we get there here and can improve uh, our uh, subsequent uh, uh, the outcomes of our PCI patients. This is a distinct pleasure for me, uh, Dr. Keeney, and Dr. Narula, who at present is in Kuwait trying to do a fundraising uh, to improve our Mount Sinai, uh, St. Luke's uh, uh, area, particularly cat lab and so. So he could not be here. He was uh, also the mastermind for this event uh, and with a special invitation. With that note, uh, the format has, uh, has been circulated. We'll have uh, two lectures, followed by we have four fellows have selected their interesting cases which will be presented uh, with the discussion by our expert panelist here. With that note, I'll invite uh, Dr. David Moliterno to come here and uh, give us little glimpses of the uh, future in this field of interventional cardiology. Thank, thank David. Thank you very thank much. You. Yeah, thank you very, very much. It's, uh, it really is a terrific honor to be here and to be at this uh, not only 100th case, but 100th complex case. In fact, I think they'll need to come up with a, a new syntax score. Maybe they'll call it the Mount Sinai score, right? Because this is like routine and customary, even though the syntax score was approaching 60, I think. So I was given this, uh, this uh, uh, title, and the talk is going to be a little bit different than you think. Most of the time, an interventional cardiologist gets up to talk about the future and talks nothing uh, except about structural heart disease, like what, what, what are we going to take on next? How are we going to do liver biopsies in the cath lab? Things like that, right? Which we do in Kentucky, by the way. <laughs> kidney and liver biopsies. All right, so I couldn't talk about the future in New York without bringing up Yogi Berra, right? I had to do that, there was no choice. I thought, gosh, if I don't lead off with this slide, I'll never get out of town. <laughs> but I think this is a great example today, the 100 cases of if you really want to influence the future, Look, you've got to grab a hold of it yourself, right? You've got to influence it yourself. You can't sit back and wait and see. Unfortunately, doctors have had the, uh, the predilection to sit back and wait, like what's happening with uh, the health care reform, right? This is happening uh, in Washington, and we shouldn't allow these sort of things to, to happen without our, our influence. Let me give you the Moliterno quote, which I thought of as I was putting this together. Look at the momentum that's currently carrying you to figure out where you're heading. I wasn't sure. I, I wasn't sure if I liked that or to flip it around f to figure out where you're heading. Look at the momentum that's carrying you. So I'm here with my son. Uh, the first time he's ever been to New York, but my son is, uh, you know, one of these millennials who likes to influence me to do different things. And so, if you've read my latest editor's page, if if it's a bicycle, I will get involved. And so I'm waiting for him to ask me to maybe ride a bicycle off from a building or something. But but anyway, we were riding our bicycles from Chattanooga to Atlanta two weeks ago, and we stayed. We take our tents, we strap everything to our bike, and we stayed next to a run a runway, an airfield. And he said, "Oh, let's see if they do skydiving here." And I, 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 it, and I said, okay. And so he literally got me on an air, a perfectly good airplane that you jump out of, <laughs> right? Uh, so, but that's where I got this quote from a moment ago, and not to bore you. But if you want to figure out where you're going, look, look at where the wind is carrying you or where momentum is carrying you. And so as we're jumping out of this airplane, literally, oh my 
it's beautiful. But I looked down and I saw all this water and I thought, oh gosh, where are we heading, right? <laughs> so, but this isn't actually us, this is the people right after us because if you know about anything about skydiving, when you first go, they, you know, they attach somebody else to you who knows what the heck you're doing. It's kind of like uh, Anapura being with Dr. Uh, Sharma, right? One of them is always steering and the other one is, uh... anyway, I won't go there, I won't go there, okay. Look, I've divided my talk up, and I'm not going to cover all this, but I wanted to give you what I thought um, are the big things influencing interventional cardiology, not just the latest valve, not just the latest war, but what's really going to be happening, I say to your generation, because uh, 10 years is not that long at all. Sunil and I were talking about uh, radial access, for example, and I said, gosh, people think this is new, it's emerging, it's just starting. No, 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 this is almost three decades it's heading for, 25 years, uh, you know, the radial access has been going on. So anyway, this is how we're going to jump into this, and that's big data. You probably know this already, but, you, you know, so much data is being collected about everything we do, but what's going to happen, this is going to become more instantaneous. Not only how are you doing with regard to clinical outcome, but how are you billing? How are you documenting? How are you coding? And the government's going to influence that. So here I'll just throw together a couple meta-analyses, and so this is what's going to happen. Large data sets are going to get pushed together, but soon I think online FFR data around the world could be collected to see how it's influencing practice, right? You can easily upload this stuff instantaneously, but here is just FFR looking at nearly 20 studies, 3,000 patients, but showing that uh, if you use guided um, procedures, like was done today in the cath lab, not just looking at the angiogram, right, because we thought the beginning of the LED looked relatively benign, but when you got in there, you could see it was under four millimeters squared, and that really influenced the case dramatically. And so I think that soon, the government, somebody's going to start forcing us, wait a minute, why didn't you use FFR or IBIS or OCT or something? Because now we have plenty of data to show how this is affecting outcome. So this is the same thing here, three randomized trials using uh, IVIS guidance. The same thing in red here is what happened if you use IVIS guidance, a substantial decrease in, in MACE, myocardial infarction, and, uh, and even uh, leaning toward uh, uh, a benefit with regard to cardiac death. It wasn't statistically significant, but this idea that we have to start embracing this. And so this is, I could stop right here, I, I won't, but this I think summarized the 100 cases that we've seen over the past years and my first couple of points. Volume is directly linked to experience. The more you do, the better you're going to get. I heard uh, Sunil talking to, to one of the fellows saying, don't worry, don't worry. As soon as you graduate, you're going to learn so much in your first year because your experience is growing with your volume of activity. But what we found in looking at people who do a lot of procedures, high volume, is that they're more likely to stick with the guidelines, appropriate utilization criteria, and we see that they're then getting better outcome. And I mentioned this today in the cath lab, that if you look something like 40% of all interventional cardiologists in the U.S. are performing 40-some cases. <clears throat> so I suspect, taking my first couple of concepts and pulling them together, I suspect, uh, y you know, Big Daddy, whomever's watching us in the insurance companies and such, are going to start uh, insisting that very complex <laughs> cases, high-risk cases, are going to need to be referred to places like this. It's the same thing happened, for example, with transplantation. You can't just dabble. You, to be a good transplant center, you've got to do plenty of cases to become very good at it. <clears throat> With regard to pharmacology and genetics, uh, I'll just mention a couple of things. L look, we've been doing this a long, long time, and I'm convinced we're making, you know, smaller and smaller and smaller advances. Why is because we've gotten event rates so very, very low. What I want to say is, though, this has been going on a long time, just like with radial artery intervention. Aspirin was discovered in the late 1800s, by the way. And this is a paper, by the way, from the South, Mississippi Valley Medical Journal, 1953, where this person uh, uh, was in a contest, kind of like a, a poster competition, say, at the ACC. And he concluded that a regular aspirin is advised to all males between 45 and 65, especially for those who are overweight. And what I want you to look at in the very bottom this guy got third prize, right, 1952 for, for that observation. So now talk about my lifetime. So I, I, I was in a medical school. I was, already, I was already in my residency at Vanderbilt when we did a prospective randomized study of patients admitted to hospital with a, an acute coronary syndrome, and they either got aspirin, heparin, both, or neither. 
neither one. Can you imagine? So in my lifetime, people were not even getting aspirin hospitalized for an acute coronary syndrome. In fact, I can remember uh, Elliot Barnathan and uh, John Hirschfeld did a post hoc study retrospectively trying to see if aspirin was needed during angioplasty. So think about this, it's just amazing. I won't go through all these data, but we were talking in the cath lab, there are so many agents now available, so many agents, but the question still comes, have we found optical, op optimal anticoagulation? And so Usman Weber and uh, Roxana are leading a fantastic trial right now, Twilight. Uh, uh, Sunil mentioned the concept, pulling aspirin out. But here's what I want to point out, and uh, Dr. Sharma mentioned this too, the COMPASS trial, but look on the left side. This is how we've reduced on, a, on an absolute percentage death, myocardial infarction, and stroke, C for cerebrovascular accident. But on the flip side, look what's happened with major bleeding. I'm not talking about minor bleeding, major bleeding. And so we've got a challenge because if you subtract these two sides, the left column and the right column, you come up with a less than 1% absolute reduction in events. That's a problem right? And so I do think it's going to be things like radial access, bivalorudin. It's going to take a combination of things to try to push this towards zero. But as Sunil said today, there's no free lunch. And this is a great example. Uh, but this has taken us decades, decades to get there. So I, what I'm trying to say is, yes, the next decade is going to have a lot but realize much of what we've accomplished so far has taken many decades. So I wouldn't expect things to be dramatically different. I mentioned this, the far right side, the lowest uh, bleeding rate was with bivalorudin and uh, a radial access. Let me move on just a little bit more with regard to pharmacology in the future. I think this one is a fantastic to Fourier study, as you saw with a, a PCSK9 uh, receptor inhibitor showing that we can push uh, LDL cholesterol even lower. Uh, dramatically low and that we can continue to lower MACE. And so I think this is something also payers are going to push us toward. Okay, we're going to uh, in, uh, provide you with the oversight of so many millions of people in, say, New York, but we're want, we want to see your data. What is the LDL cholesterol and how are you going to take responsibility for this? So too, people are talking about the CANTOS trial, how fabulous that we're giving a monoclonal antibody to patients with heart disease. But we did this 20-some years ago. Uh, we were using pexilizumab uh, during uh, acute myocardial infarction. So here, this drug, uh, in inhibitor of interleukin-1-beta, terrific. What I think is most terrific about this study is not the uh, impressive reduction in C-reactive protein from the blue line and placebo on the top down to the highest dose of uh, the drug in orange. And I don't even, I'm not even that super impressed by the, you know, less than 1% lowering in major adverse cardiovascular events. It's great. I love it. But is looking at these off-target effects, a reduction in cancer mortality. So you can see here a 51% reduction in death from any cancer with a monoclonal antibody to interleukin-1-beta. And if, uh, important to me in Kentucky where we have uh, uh, the highest uh, smoking rate and death rate from lung cancer in the United States, you can see a two-thirds reduction uh, in lung cancer incidence by using this drug. So fantastic, uh, fantastic things. What I'll do over the next uh, few minutes is talk about where uh, interventional cardiology has gone. Uh, so this is the, uh, this is the uh, table of Andreas Grunzig. This is his uh, kitchen table where he would eat his meals. And this is where he helped uh, with his wife uh, uh, to develop uh, the first angioplasty balloon catheter that we used. So this is back in the 1970s, and uh, Dr. King gave me the slide. He said he was there uh, in the home having uh, dinner with Andreas and his wife at this very table, but he always points out the, the bottle of wine in the background that they used while, <laughs> while, while creating these, which is important. What I wanted to show relative to the case today, now remember, this was done <clears throat> 40 years ago. In fact, this isn't the first case. This is case number four. Case number four that Andreas did, and it's very similar to what was done today in our cath lab, right? So this is a, a left main lesion. Of course, today it was even more complex going into the LAD and the circumflex. But he did this case, the fourth case, uh, without surgical backup, uh, without uh, the Internet, uh, without uh, live broadcasting, uh, but got a very nice result. And so look now, 40 years later, we have a prospective randomized study uh, between um, um, bypass surgery and percutaneous intervention uh, with, a lower, uh, with a lower risk score, but now showing 
had several year outcome, uh, the risk of death MI or stroke equipoise, roughly 15% among both groups, and so evidencing that we can in fact take on these cases now uh, with, good, with, with good proof. But look, it took four decades to get from that fourth case now to this uh, three year outcome. Structural valves, uh, I'll talk just a few minutes about that. I, uh, th there's a lot that's already been talked about over the past couple of years, but what I think will happen is we'll get bored, and, and we're going to go beyond, beyond these areas. Like I said, in our cath lab, we, we literally do uh, liver biopsies. We do some kidney biopsies. We do a lot of uh, various things, almost like interventional radiologists, and I think that's what's going to happen in our field. Certainly, we'll take on the mitral and the tricuspid valve, but I think we'll continue to go outside of our, our usual domain. This is the next slide I wanted to point out, and it's back to this idea of what's going to happen over the next decade. Some people say, oh, wow, this big emergence in, in TAVR. No, TAVR's been going on for a long time, y you know, not quite 20 years, but you can see here just uh, with the development of the Sapien system, this has been going on for now more than uh, one decade. What you're going to see, though, is the big uptake in some of these slides from Stefan Windecker. You can see on the left side what's happening with that asymptotic straight upward line in the United States, but also in Germany. So this is just going to keep growing and growing and growing and become clearly a preferred strategy, at least for high and intermediate risk. We'll see what happens with the low-risk patients uh, soon. What's going to happen, of course, is there will be continued, I think, mild step rise iterations. This is probably the current uh, thinking is how do we protect the, the brain, even though we see a lot of showering of emboli to the head. People are still doing the crossword puzzles as fast as they were before, but I think that will be an important area to work on. And then, of course, trying to make things simpler, easier, and better, probably back to the radial, radial access uh, uh, soon. All right. This is the other thing. <clears throat> Insurance companies, uh, I think, with big data are going to ask us to do things not only better but faster. And so this was in CCI uh, last year showing a, a same-day discharge a after a TAVR. Mitral valve is going to be even bigger, in my view, but more complex and take longer. Why is that? Uh, because there's more people out there with mitral valve disease than with aortic valve disease, and so you'll see uh, red and blue that red will, uh, in the next decade or so, take over uh, versus a TAVR just because of the volume of things. There are multiple ways, though, to approach the valve. One of the things the surgeons taught us early on, better to keep your own valve. So the surgeons will often say the best valve you can use is the patient's. And so I think there will be more uh, inkling or leaning towards valve repair versus replacement, even though, like in surgery, replacement may be the easier thing to do. I believe probably the better thing to, will be to repair the valve. Unlike the aortic valve, though, the mitral valve is very complex. There's a lot happening with the annulus, there's a lot happening with the corda tendony, and a lot happening with the valve structure uh, itself. So again, from Stefan and others, we're on a, the left side, we see a simple, straightforward <laughs> approach with TAVI. On the right side, probably the, uh, the mitral valve replacement is going to be more complex and a lot more toys for us to deal with. For example, this is something we saw at the journal recently, and it's the idea of using 3D modeling. So what if somebody already has a prosthetic aortic valve in, if I put in a prosthetic uh, mitral valve in the lower part, is it going to impinge or affect the already present by leaflet aortic valve? And here they actually use 3D modeling, put the uh, percutaneous uh, uh, mitral valve in place to prove, in fact, it was not going to impinge upon or affect the uh, aortic valve. The tricuspid valve will emerge very quickly. You'll see several papers coming out over the next months about this, and it will be uh, at least as big, if not bigger, than the tricuspid valve. Why is because it's been overlooked. It's the ugly stepchild of, uh, of, of surgical heart disease. There's a lot more of it, but it's not being uh, addressed largely, as you'll see on both the left and right panels. This is rough roughly representing 1% of all uh, uh, valvular disease being uh, uh, treated mechanically. So too, there will be multiple devices, whether they're put into the vena cava, whether they're put into the valve itself, uh, to try to affect the, uh, uh, the uh, tricuspid system. I think what this will, no pun intended, bleed over into is the uh, effect of patients or treatment of patients with congestive heart failure. Why is because while, while Dr. Mehta Sharma uh, and Keeney and others can affect uh, uh, um, 
the, the, the cardiac vasculature, and patients aren't going to be then dying, say, with sudden cardiac death or ischemic heart disease. They are going to transition to have uh, more and more heart failure. And so on the top, whereas we're putting most of our attention in electrophysiologic treatment of patients with sudden cardiac death on the bottom, I think you'll see a move towards more structural interventions to try to keep people alive longer with congestive heart failure. Here's just one example, a clever device that I think will be uh, uh, further iterated. Uh, so you can either treat a ASD or you can create an ASD, but you can put pressure sensors on this ASD with a membrane that could open and close. So you could decompress or lower the pressure in the left atrium for somebody who's having pulmonary congestion and decide how much blood to send over to the right atrium, so forcibly giving them a left to right intracardiac shunt to treat heart failure symptoms and whether you're using uh, 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 something like the CardioMEMS de device, but you could use some pressure monitor on the left atrium to see once it reaches a certain level to open the damper and to allow some blood to go into the right atrium. What I said in the case today, and I believe will be the future, is that what's going to happen is adult interventional cardiology is going to start uh, affecting other fields. So there's far more structural heart treatments being done among uh, adult patients. So as you know, there's about a 10 to 1 ratio of adult interventional cardiologists to pediatric interventional cardiologists. And so I think as we keep pushing the envelope for valvular treatments, for um, other structural treatments, I believe this is going to float the boat and improve pediatric cardiology. But I see this happening in other areas. So one of the things I've tried to do as chairman of medicine is increase interventional GI interventional nephrology, interventional pulmonary. These fields are slowly withering. What's happened across the United States, to be quick and brief, is that many residents are going into hospital medicine. Why? They can make more money, more money than some specialists, say endocrine, rheumatology, infectious disease. They can make more, and, and they don't have to do a fellowship. Well, what's happening then is people aren't choosing these other areas, and so at our institution, we're creating sub-subspecialty fellowships. So we have interventional GI, interventional pulmonary, interventional nephrology, where we're teaching them how to do ultrasound of the thyroid or the kidney, and how to do their own biopsies, how to do their own procedures, and this is becoming very popular, and I think what we're going to have to do to support these uh, fields. So what I think is going to happen, in my opinion, is there's probably going to be a convergence at some point down the road where there will be one structural uh, training among cardiac surgeon, interventional uh, cardiologists, and probably interventional radiologists. This is probably going to pull together more of the next decade. And I know important to, to me and important to Roxanne is also trying to get more women involved in uh, interventional cardiology. My son's an engineering student, and the same thing, there's not as many engineer females out there, and so we need to do the same thing uh, in interventional cardiology. So on the bottom is showing that only 7.2 percent of uh, interventional cardiologists are females, so I think we will as a, as a group, as a society, try to improve this. So it was a very quick talk. Um, I tried to show you, I think, what I think the influences are going to be of big data uh, that pharmacology will continue to uh, advance, though a bit slowly, that for sure will continue to build on not aortic but mitral and tricuspid valve programs, and that we will probably go beyond the heart and beyond the brain uh, to other areas. And I think that we will also improve areas such as pediatric cardiology and then other areas in internal medicine. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that was super fast, but I know you <laughs> it's New York. A whole glimpse of what the future is coming. So your last slide was about the training program. Yeah. And now knowing that beyond intervention, now the structural training, then endovascular training, do you think there will be also subspecialty boards for them? Yes, I, I, sh I sure do. Uh, and this is one place I'm pleased at least the United States is out in front. So uh, last week several of us were in Italy, and it's impressive that they don't have formal training, you know, fellowships in Italy for intervention, even though they do terrific interventions. And so I think that the United States is led in that regard, but, uh, but I do think there will be structural, and it'll just continue. Remember, it was 1999, I think, uh, that, that, that uh, so 77 interventions started, but it was 22 years later before we got the boards for interventional cardiology. So it'll take us a while, but we'll get there. Yeah, we were 98. We were the first one to take us. Yeah. No, 98. 99. 99. 99. She's got you. Sorry. I'm, I'm right. Usually you're right, but That's here. That's <laughs> no, I, I, I remember very well because I went into the test. I went into the test room, and sitting to my left was Steve Ellis, and sitting to my right was Mike Linkoff. And I thought, oh dear God, I'm screwed. Right? <laughs> if they're grading on a curve, I just failed. <laughs>
you my my other side was Greg Stone and uh, the other side was Marty Leon. Oh, <laughs> oh. we have it here. Wow, who wrote the, the first? <laughs> yeah, and first one. Yeah, first no, I remember. I was there. I took that exam <laughs> the same year. Yeah. So. Okay. So any for the question, this has been a great uh, morning, and uh, we really thank you, uh, David, to come here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you.